Okay, so we are in 2 Kings, so Old Testament, right? If you're like me, and sometimes you forget where that is, there's always a, uh, you know, table of contents at the front. Oh. I thought I was being called out of class to go to the principal's office or something. Um... But uh, yeah, we're in 2 Kings. We are going to start, after today, we are going to start speeding things uh, along a little bit in this. As a reminder, um, our Wednesday class, you know, we finished, uh, we were talking about hell and heaven and what have you. So this upcoming Wednesday, we're starting kind of a new series that's looking at the hymns uh, that we sing. And so it'll be a little bit of a different format. Uh, because, you know, if you look at the hymnal, most of the hymns, they've kind of got a verse there that they're associated with. And so we're going to learn the story behind the hymn. Uh, and then uh, one of our song leaders, I haven't had a chance to talk to Perry, but I already talked to Mike, uh, to, will lead us in that particular hymn. And uh, then we'll look at that verse and, and study that uh, and what have you, you know, because Paul wrote that he would pray in the Spirit and he'd pray with the understanding and that he would sing in the Spirit and sing with the understanding as well. And so, you know, we, uh, when we're singing hymns, uh, there are doctrinal ideas and theological ideas in there. And so we, we want to understand what we're singing. I mean, how many times have you maybe sang, here I raise my Ebenezer, and you're like, what in the world is an Ebenezer, and why am I raising him, you know? And then you, if you're younger, you might say, are you talking about Ebenezer Scrooge? And we, you know, anyhow. So, yeah, so if you can be here on Wednesday, I think that's going to be a fun set of studies that we're going to go through. And, uh, yeah, join us, 7, 7 o'clock. Okay, so... Uh, we, had, we, we had gone through and we were looking at Ace's tragic end, Jehoshaphat ruling in, in righteousness, and, um, and we were coming to the apostasy of Joash. Um, you know, uh, after the death of Athaliah, uh, Joash, remember we're going through these different kings, and after the death of Athaliah, Joash began his rule over Judah under the guiding hand of a priest, uh, Jehoiada, or Jehoiada, tomato, tomato, I'm sure. Um, and he repaired, he repaired the temple, and unlike, you know, the period of Judges where it says that the people did things that were right in their own eyes, well, in 2 Kings chapter 12 and verse 2, it's a little different. 2 Kings chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, And Joash did what was right in the sight of Yahweh, the sight of the Lord, all his days in which Jehoiada the priest instructed him. So when we look at the period of the judges, you know, we have people that are doing right that which is right in their own eyes. They're, they're going after their own idols. They're trying to fulfill the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Right? But then we have Joash who comes along and he is, um, he is doing this uh, all of the days of the, in, in which Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Right? Now, when Jehoiada died, um, Joash, he succumbed to the evil influences of the princes of Judah. And he led the nation into idolatry. And that's a, a very important point for us to remember as, you know, New Testament Christians. Here we have, this is Old Testament, right? But we know that God, Jesus, the Spirit, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, should they allow tomorrow to come. It, but we have an individual who is in a leadership role, being king, but had a priest guiding him and telling him, look, this is what you need to do to please God. You need to tear down, uh, you know, all of these places of idol worship. You need to rebuild the, the temple here. You need to do this. You, you know, and he's guiding him. And as long as the priest was there to help, things were fine. 
But as soon as the priest died, as soon as there was no biblical, I'll say biblical, but as soon as there, there was no godly guidance, that's when he fell into apostasy. Right? And the point that I'm making is important for us as Christians to be that guiding light for the world. You know, we're to be a city set on a hill that's not hidden. We're supposed to let our light shine before men and, and, and all of these things because if we don't, and I realize that there are times we might say, you know what, people don't want to listen. People don't want to hear what I have to say. People don't want Christians to talk. They'd rather do this and that. And so sometimes, yeah, it can be easy to just kind of turn over and play dead and say, well, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to do it anymore. Well, there's a couple of things wrong with that. The first is that it goes against a direct command of Christ in Matthew 28. You know, the Great Commission where we are to go out into all of the world and to teach and to preach and to baptize. So it's disobedience. And Jesus said, if you love me, what? You'll keep my commandments. And so if we're failing to do even that, if even inviting someone to services or what have you, then that's not really showing our love for God. But then the second thing, too, is that it is, for lack of a better phrase, it's allowing evil to win, right? Uh, we've probably heard that all it takes for evil to flourish is for good men to do nothing. And that's exactly right. You know, we have to be like that bumper sticker that was popular in the 60s and 70s. We've got to keep on keeping on. You know, we've got to keep on trucking and not grow weary, the Bible says, in doing good. You know, people need, people need guidance. Everyone needs some type of guidance. And, and you, we, we're in a position of offering that from a biblical perspective. And that doesn't mean that you have to be a Bible thumper. Okay? And by that, I mean, you don't have to sit there and shove the Bible down someone's throat every time you open your mouth. Because, truthfully, that can do more harm than good. Because then they're not going to want to talk to you because that's all that you're bringing up. So it, it's, uh, there was a quote, and I can't remember who said it, but it's several hundred years old. But it's preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Right? Live the gospel. And you can teach biblical principles. And there will come a time when it will open up or the door will open up. Sometimes it's a matter of getting to know people. You know? And, and, but we have that here and that he had this, this godly guidance from, from a priest and things were going well, but as soon as the priest died, he started listening to everybody else. He started listening to culture, we could say, and fell into idolatry. Idolatry, we know, people often think of idolatry as, you know, these big statues and everybody would come and worship. And yes, they did have those. But ultimately, idolatry is prioritizing other things before God. You know, uh, there are people who make <coughs> idols out of preachers, you know, and they'll say, well, you'll hear like, well, my pastor says this, right? Uh, or uh, my elder says this or preacher says this or whatever. It's like, frankly, and I don't mean any disrespect to them. I don't care what they say. It's what does God say? It's what God says that matters. Right? It, think about it. And, and I know that there are sometimes people will say, well, you can't judge a person's heart. Right? That's kind of true. It's kind of not true. But that's, <coughs> that's for another day. And I realize 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7 says, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Here's the thing. When we have Paul in Acts chapter 17, and you know, he's in Thessalonica. And they try to have him killed for preaching. And he goes to Berea. And we read in Acts 17 and verse 11 that, that these, the Bereans, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, right? And it says that they heard the word with all readiness. 
And they searched the scriptures to see what was so. Right? They searched the scriptures. They didn't say, well, Paul's heart's in the right place. Paul's, no, it, it's like even Paul, you know, even his words were measured against the word of God and what had, what had been written. Why would I or anybody else think that we should receive any different treatment? We should always test things. We're told to test things. And so when Jehoiada died, Joash, he succumbs to these princes and their thinking culture, goes to idolatry, turns a deaf ear to the prophets that God sent to aid him in returning to the right way of God. So he's got a priest and he's following him and he's going along the right path. The priest dies and he goes into idolatry. And God says, I'm sending someone else into your life to try to get you on the right path. And he's just ignoring them. And then when God moves Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, to rebuke the nation of Judah for her sin, Joash ordered him stoned in the court of the temple. And Joash died by the hand of his servants. Um, and, you know, as he had a disease and he was on his bed. So think about that. You have a guy who's guided by a priest and he's doing things right. The priest dies, and this guy falls into idolatry. Prophets are sent. He doesn't pay attention. It's like, you know what? I am going to send the son of the priest, the, the son of the priest that you listened to, the son of the priest that guided you. And he's going to say, stone him. That's a big leap right there, just to show how depraved uh, he had become in, in his idolatry. Any thoughts or comments? Going once, going twice, Co uh, questions? Okay. So then we're looking at Amaziah, the fourth king of Judah, had s some righteous influence on, uh, on the nation. He was the son of Joash. Uh, he avenged his father's death, um, and he began his reign by refusing to kill their children uh, uh, because he had respect for, for God's law that says, um, uh, The father shall not put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. That's in Deuteronomy 24 and verse 16. And so he avenged his father's death, but he refused to kill the children because he had some respect for, for God's law. And But when we're preparing for war uh, against Edom, uh, he called to the prophet of, of God, or he listened rather, to the prophet of God, and he dismissed 100,000 mercenaries that he had hired out of Israel to assist him in battle. Yes, sir? Who was calling for him to kill children? Who, who, what, well, I mean, from? it was a typical practice. There are, in some cases, where God ordered an entire people to be slaughtered. Uh, men, women, children, uh, clean, you know, when he told Israel, for example, to go into a particular land, it was, you know, purge the land of, of, of everything. So there were times that, that it was ordered by God. Uh, some, it would be, um, you know, just their own wickedness. For some, it would be the people themselves who would kill their children, you know. Um, but, yeah, he was... Uh, uh, but he refused to do that. It, advice of princes and people. Oh, yes, ma'am. It was to fight Israel. The mercenaries were going to fight who? Well, he had, he had hired mercenaries out of Israel to do battle out with Edom. E-D-O-M. E -D -O -M. Okay, thank you. And, but you're welcome. But, so he dismissed them, though. He, he gets rid of them. And that's not the first time that we read about something like this in Scripture either. 
Uh, remember that there are times when God has said, you know, you've got these few, because if, if, you've, if you're outnumbering them, you're going to think you did it on your own. You know? And so, and when he comes back in victory, a victory that was only possible from God, he brought the idols of Edom back with him to serve as his own. So even though he had a slight respect for God's law in the sense that he's not killing children, and he fires 100,000 mercenaries, you know, and he, he is victorious in battle because of God, he brings idols back. And he serves those idols. It's almost like in the New Testament, and I can't remember the verse offhand, it's, it's like it says, it's like a dog returning to his own vomit. You know? And that, that's what it is. And I could say how many times, or ask, how many times has that happened to us? You know, we live a certain way, and we go through an event, or something happens, and in hindsight, we look back and we say, there's no way that was possible except for God. But then we look, and we've actually gone back to the way we were living before that event even happened. You know, it, it, it didn't stick. And, and so um, he threatened to kill the prophet who had uh, rebuked him. And... Uh, he died later uh, second, in Second Chronicles 25. Uh, he dies years later because his own subjects, his own people, kill him. Thoughts, comments? Sounds like that happens a lot. Yeah. His own people kill him. Might have been a good thing if they'd done it sooner. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like people. Yeah, you know, if you could go back in time, would you kill Hitler as a baby? That type of thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, and the, I mean, there's, uh, uh, there's, and I can't remember, man, I wish I could remember which king it was, but there is one in the Old Testament, and it's almost like a movie that the person goes up to the king, pulls a knife from the cloak, jabs it in the king's stomach all the way up to the hill, and he's just like, I've got a message from God. <laughs> you know? I'm like, wow, that's a movie right there. <laughs> Anyhow. And so we've got Uzziah. Uh, Uzziah, uh, he's the ninth king of Judah. He started in righteousness. We, now we're up to 2 Chronicles 26. So you've got 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. And so we're up to 2 Chronicles 26, and verse 5, uh, And he continued to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding through the vision of God, and as long as he sought Yahweh, God made him succeed. So it's like as long as he was seeking after God, then... You know, thing, then he was successful. And we can really liken that to Matthew chapter 6 in the New Testament and verse 33 where Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things. The clothes you're talking about, the food, and all, you, you're going to get all that. Right? You'll get all that. Seek first the kingdom of God. And so... Uh, but So as long as he was seeking after God, he prospered. God aided Uzziah in his defeat of the Philistines, the Arabians, and several others, the Ammonites. Um, he fortified Jerusalem. He built that up. Uh, he enriched Judah, um, uh, not only in um, uh, you know, lands, but also crops and, and monies and what have you. He had a standing army of over 307,000 people. Um, and also in 2 Chronicles 26 and verse 16, it says, But when he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly. 
And he was unfaithful to Yahweh his God. And he entered the temple of Yahweh to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now, what does the Bible say about pride? Yeah, pride comes before the destruction, an arrogant spirit before the fall. That's what happened here. Yeah. He, modern terms, we might just say he got too big for his britches. You know? That's right, I said britches. I know. Look, it's not a term we use much often, but I think we should bring it back. Let's bring back britches. I'm going to make a sign. <laughs> so, and he was confronted and, and rebuked by the priest and 80 additional priests. You see that there uh, in, the, in the next verse. Then Azariah, this is verse 17 of Second Chronicles 26. Then Azariah, the priest, entered after him and with 80 priests, men of valor... And they stood against Uzziah the king and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to Yahweh, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are set apart as holy to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary. You've been unfaithful, and you will have no honor from Yahweh. Now, really, that's, that speaks to New Testament principle as well. Hey, can anybody guess kind of maybe where we're looking at in the New Testament here? If not, that's okay. Church discipline anyone? You know? In the sense that when, when you look at it, you have someone, he has fallen into idolatry, he's no longer seeking after God, and yet he thinks that he has a place, that he has a right to come in and to burn incense, to, to participate in the worship of the priest. Now what are we... I know we're Christians, but right, we are, Peter says, a royal priesthood, right? And so, you know, we have that, and they, they come in and they're like, look, this isn't for you. You've rejected God. You're not following God. This is for God's people, you know? And so the, there is kind of the principle there. It's not too much of a stretch, but you need to kind of flesh it out a little bit more. But he's confronted, and then, but Uzziah, this is 2 Chronicles 26 and verse 19, but Uzziah with a censer in his hand for burning incense was enraged, and while he was enraged with the priests, the leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the house of God beside the altar of incense. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous on his forehead, head, and they hurried him out of there, and he himself also hastened to get out because God had smitten him. God had cursed him. So verse 21, so King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. He lived in a separate house being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of God. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. And so we have that this, this man who started off kind of okay, at least a little bit, you know, got too big for his britches, started worshiping false idols, and he goes in there and he thinks that he can do what the priests are doing. The priests... Loyal as they are, try to stand in the way. Look, look, you need to get out of here. This isn't for you. This isn't your duty, your responsibility, what have you. And yet he, he gets mad at them. And God says, no, I'm not having it. And he strikes him with leprosy. And he strikes him with leprosy. And then he is rushed out of the temple, has to live on his own, he can't go among the community even, can't go into worship. Because remember, the lepers, they had to sit there and kind of clap, you know, and, and say that they were unclean so that people would, would not come near them. 
That's why the lepers in the New Testament really kind of freaked out that Jesus walked right up to them and touched them and healed them and everything else. You know? So he was cut off. The one thing that always kind of gets me about this is I wonder who he blamed. I wonder who, I'm, yeah, I wonder who he blamed. Think about it. If you have someone like that, there are some people who they would blame God. God gave me this leprosy. Or they blame maybe the 80 priests. Oh, well, the priests and everything, they shouldn't have been telling me what to do anyways. Or they'd sit there and blame, you know, God. It's God's fault. But I, I wonder if at any point in the rest of his life, in living as a leper, off, away from community, never being able to go into the tent of meeting or anything like that, I wonder if he ever said, you know what, this is really my fault. Because me personally, based off of other accounts that I read, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, I have no doubt in my mind that had he repented, God would have taken the leprosy as quick as he put it on. That's who God is. I mean, you think, for example, when the people were wandering and they were... Uh, getting bitten by poisonous snakes and all of this, God gave them a way out. You know, and lifting this serpent up, and Jesus would talk about that in the New Testament, where he would say, just as this was lifted up, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. You know? And so, I have no doubt, though, David and all of his issues, have no doubt that if he had repented and turned to God, would have been taken over. Yeah, or taken away. Even Judas. Yeah, even Judas did. You know? Yep, not in God's plan. Uh, thoughts or comments? Okay, one last one. Then we'll look at Jotham. Jotham, he succeeds his uh, father Uzziah on the throne of Judah. Second Chronicles 27 and verse 6. So Jotham became strong... And why did he become strong there in verse 6? Because he established his ways before Yahweh his God. Walked steadfastly. Yeah, walked steadfastly. He became strong because he put God first. See, that's the problem. Too often we try to rely on our own strength and things that we believe that we can do. When if we would just kind of you know, push the ego out of the way and just, for lack of a better phrase, allow God to be God. If I can say it that way, I know there's some people online that are going to call me a heretic for saying that, but that's the only way I can think of right now. But if we could just basically get out of our own way, focus on God, everything else will take care of itself. You know, James writes, you know, what is your life but a vapor? Here one moment. Gone the next. Don't say you're doing anything tomorrow. You don't even know if tomorrow's happening. That's true. You know? Jesus said tomorrow's got enough worries of its own. Right? So the high places. Now the high places, these are elevated sites of sacrificial activity built by Judah as additions to the temple in Jerusalem as designated by God. So, and Jotham's failure to remove these unauthorized places uh, of assembly, it was the only negative statement made about his reign of 16 years. His failure to do that, that was the only negative thing that people said about, said about him. And among the kings of Judah who had righteous uh, influence on the nation. Only um, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, and Josiah tried to fully restore uh, God's pattern of worship by destroying those humanly devised um, settings uh, where people were using uh, it, like animal sacrifice and incense and what have you. It was just a few. Can you say them again? Uh, Jehoshaphat and Josiah. 
And that again speaks to the New Testament. There are two roads, right? There's a broad path and there's a narrow path and there's going to be few who find it. And of all, in all these people, we've got these three who really tried to do what was right. And it's, it's like John Knox, uh, the um, Protestant reformer, once said, even if it's just you and God, that's a majority. There's a thousand people. Who cares if there's a thousand people if they don't, if they don't have God? You, and God? you plus God equals a majority. And if they've got God, then they shouldn't be your enemy anyways. So, thoughts, comments, complaints, questions? So those three stayed steadfast the whole time. Where others started good and didn't end up. Um, I wouldn't say the whole time. I would say that they did their best. That they were... They were kind of the cream of the crop, if you will. <laughs> Maybe put it that way. You know, of the of two evils, the lesser evil. I, you know, however you want to phrase it. But yeah. Where were they in heaven? I don't know. You know, I I, I don't know who all's who all's up there. You know what I mean? Because you think about it too. I mean, we only have what the Bible says. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's. It, uh, I, I just, I'll be honest with you, I just hope to see myself in heaven, you know? Uh, that's kind of God's, God's judgment, and I just kind of do what I can. I'll be, you know, if I, I, if I am fortunate enough to make it to heaven, I'll be more kind of tripped out if I see the thief on the cross up there. That's going to throw me, you know? I'd be like, there are so many people on earth saying you're not up here, you know? Uh, I missed your... Thing, uh, can I see hell? Oh. Yeah, I that. And, and I've got to put the I've got to put those notes on there. But we do have the classes on the YouTube on YouTube. But uh, I'll uh, thank you. That's a reminder for me to put um, to put those notes on there. So. Thought, other thoughts, comments? Okay. Well, I appreciate y'all's kind attention.